I'm standing here in the shadow of Pendle Hill, an area of Lancashire in England by now famous for its Pendle Witches. Most of us associate the Pendle Witches with Halloween or Samhain as it's known in the Pagan Wheel of the Year. But in fact, a significant part of the story of the Pendle Witches happened during Lammas season. A time where it's traditional for the first crops to be harvested and stored for the long winter ahead. And when we notice the shortening of daylight hours. A time when the hawthorn berries are reddening on the bough and the summer berries are quick to ripen in the last few weeks of warm sunshine. A time when the hedgerows are teeming with wildflowers and herbs and meadowsweet grows gracefully by every river bank, beck and stream. The story of the Pendle Witches is shrouded in legend and mystery. There's much speculation and theory about it, but one thing is for certain. In the Lama season of 1612, the women and men accused of witchcraft were shut away some 43 miles from here in the dungeons at Lancaster Castle. The Pendle Witch story and this landscape have fascinated me ever since I was a teenager and I've been a regular visitor here for well over three decades. And I've made the journey to Pendle again with Lamas season only a week away. I want to follow in the footsteps of the Pendle Witches, discover the magic of this place all over again. I want to roam through the landscape where they once roamed, harnessing the power of plants for healing and magical purposes. The story of the Pendle Witches is well documented in books and YouTube videos and so it's not my intention here to provide an exhaustive historical account. But as we walk through the fields and woods and through villages along ancient trackways, we'll talk about the main details of the case. And stay tuned until the end to see how I tie in this visit with my own Lamas celebrations. And I'm interested in finding out how the so-called Pendle Witches may have celebrated the ancient Feast of Lamas. There's a saying that if you want to find out about a people, find out about their land. So later, I want to take you up close to the herbs and plants and flowers that grow in this area during Lamas season. The story centres around two families and at the head of each, a powerful matriarch. Elizabeth Southerns, also known as Old Demdike, is thought to have lived at Malkin Tower near Newchurch with her daughter Elizabeth Davis and grandchildren James, Alison and Janet. And Anne Whittle, also known as Old Chattox, lived with her daughter Anne Redfern a little further afield near Fence. Both women were thought to have been cunning or wise women and would have had an intimate knowledge about the landscape and herbs and plants and flowers and their uses and they were also said to be bitter rivals all of their lives, perhaps in part due to having to compete for custom in local villages. In March 1612, Demdike's granddaughter Alison was begging in local lanes when she came across an old peddler from Halifax named John Law. She asked him for some pins and he refused, so she cursed him and moments later he fell to the ground. Days later, when recovering at a local inn, John Law was ready to forgive Alison for bewitching him, but his son Abraham took the matter to the local magistrate, Roger Knoll, and the rest is history. In the weeks that followed, seemingly convinced that she had indeed bewitched John Law, Alison confessed all to Roger Knoll and at the same time incriminated rival family Chattox and her daughter Anne Redfern, who in turn pointed the finger at Demdike, Alison's grandmother. 
In early April 1612, Roger Knoll ordered that Chattox, her daughter Anne Redfern, Demdike and her granddaughter Alison were taken to Lancaster Castle to await trial. And here began the long 43 mile journey that they were said to have made on foot. It's thought that they took a route from Fence through Newchurch, Barley, Downham, with nothing but rags bound to their feet. And bearing in mind that Demdike and Chattox were both said to be in their 80s at the time, this was no easy feat. And I've often thought that given their age and given the fact that they were said to have lived in poverty and you know had very impoverished lives, these factors would support the view that they were really powerful and skilled herbalists. Because at this particular period of history, of course, people, and especially poor people, didn't, as a rule, live until the ripe old age of 80. The next significant date in the story is Good Friday 1612, when Demdike's daughter Elizabeth held a gathering at Malkin Tower with understandably worried family and friends. Their gathering was discovered by the local constable Hargreaves who reported back to Roger Knoll and Knoll went on to accuse them of meeting for some sort of dark witch's sabbat. The Good Friday gathering gave rise to further interrogations. This time Knoll questioned Demdike's daughter Elizabeth and her children James and Janet. Allegedly Demdike's grandchildren were more than willing to denounce their grandmother as a witch all but young Janet were arrested and sent to Lancaster Dungeons, along with five other local people who had in some way been implicated with the gathering and accusations of witchcraft. The passage of time has cast some doubt on the credibility of these alleged confessions and Roger Knoll's motives for finding so-called witches in local villages has been seen as a manoeuvre to gain favour with King James I, who was on the throne of England at the time. It's fairly well known that King James I had a pathological fear of witches and had written a book called Demonology, which has been described as a mandate to the British to hunt witches. But the King's book, Demonology, like all other such witch hunting manuals, was also incredibly misogynistic. Unmarried and widowed women were often viewed with suspicion and it's perhaps no coincidence that several of the women who were tried in the case were widows, including Demdike, Chattox and Alice Nutter. And it was in King James's Bible where the phrase, Thou shall not suffer a witch to live, was set down in print only a year before the arrests. But as we'll see later, that's not to say that some of the women in this case didn't practice folk magic or believe in superstitions. But it can also be said that they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, victims of religious and political persecution and zealotry, and their beliefs and practices could be used against them. For months and during the Lamas season of 1612, the accused sat in a dark dungeon in Lancaster, a filthy, squalid dungeon where it is said that they were each chained to an iron ring in the centre of the cell floor. By the time the Lancaster Assizes opened on August 17, 1612, Demdike had succumbed to the awful conditions in the cell and had died. And she was spared witnessing her own granddaughter, Jeanette, testifying against all present. Because in the end, most of the accused were condemned to death based on the evidence given by a nine-year-old child. On 
On August 20th, 1612, the ten condemned were led up Gallows Hill in the outskirts of Lancaster, where they were hung before jeering crowds. Alice Nutter protested her innocence until the very end. It's not known how the bodies were disposed of or where they were buried, but that hasn't stopped speculation as to where their remains lie. There's a persistent belief, for example, that Alice Nutter is buried in St Mary's at New Church in Pendle, in an old grave bearing the name Nutter, and which has become known as the Witch's Grave. An idea that has led to a sign being pinned to a wall in the porch at St Mary's, where the myth of the Witch's Grave is effectively dismissed on the grounds that no one who was executed as a witch could be buried in a churchyard. The same church sign debunks the idea that the eye seen here on the church tower is that of the evil eye to ward off witches and instead claims that it was originally a hole in the tower used as a lookout point for oncoming weddings and funerals that was later filled in. Today, the legacy of the Pendle Witches lives on in the sizeable tourist industry and local businesses such as Witches Galore trade on the historical link with the Pendle Witch story. And it's all relatively harmless as long as we remember that beneath the phantasmagorical caricatures and the bump in the night folklore, there were real people involved. And this was recognised in 2012, 400 years later, when local people and the Borough Council held a huge festival to remember the Pendle Witches. That said, only one of them was commemorated with a statue. Alice Nutter's statue stands in the village where she lived in the 17th century, roughly. And it's often asked why there was preferential treatment for Alice. Some speculate that it was due to the fact she was of a very different class to the others that were accused. It's believed she was actually a wealthy woman and may have owned roughly Old Hall, which still stands in the village. Others claim that she was totally innocent, but wrongly accused of being at Malkin Tower by Demdike's granddaughter, Janet. Sympathy for Alice is also born out of the realisation that she was a devout Catholic living during a time when, under a newly reformed Protestant England, Catholicism was all too often conflated with witchcraft. And given James I's fear of Catholics, it was just as dangerous at the time to be a Catholic as it was to be a witch. One of the reasons why the Pendle Witch Trial is one of the most famous of its kind is because it was extremely well documented by the then clerk to the court, Thomas Potts, who later published a book called The Wonderful Discovery of Witches in the County of Lancaster. The confessions of the so-called witches recorded in Potts' book give a fascinating insight into old beliefs and folk magical practices. The idea, for example, of the witch's familiar or a spirit guide taking form in animals such as dogs, hare or birds was mentioned as matter of fact in some of the testimonies. Alison, in her initial confession to Roger Knoll in March 1612, for example, ostensibly admitted to being helped to lane John Law by her familiar spirit who appeared to her on the lane at that moment in the guise of a black dog. And of course, this extraordinary account was, for Roger Knoll, evidence that Alison was in league with the devil. But as local historian John Clayton points out, the endowment of animals with spiritual power is as old as the hills, and in the case of the Pendle Forest would have filtered down the generations here from the Iron Age, if not before. Potsy's book also records the moment where the court asked Alison Devis if she could reverse the curse placed upon John Law, to which she answered that she couldn't, but had her grandmother Demdike have lived, she would have helped him. Demdike emerges from this account as a powerful healer and wise woman, 
and before modern medicine such people were a lifeline especially in rural communities but they could also quite easily garner suspicion and fear from neighbours who could turn on them at any time and accuse them of witchcraft for every ill fortune that occurred in their own lives. The role of Demdike and Chattox as cunning or wise women is underexplored in the available literature. But how they may have used local plants, herbs and flowers in their practices is an interesting area of research. And so I decided to explore the local countryside for ideas and inspiration of how to tie my visit in with my upcoming Bama celebrations. I began my walk in Downham, one of the villages where the accused walked on their way to Lancaster Castle. The village of Downham is absolutely beautiful and has earned itself the reputation of being one of the prettiest villages in Lancashire. In surrounding fields, fog grass grows in abundance, as does yarrow. There are several hawthorn trees and hawthorn hedges in this village too and the surrounding area. A tree that has traditionally been associated with the Fae, but also with witches. And this is evident in some of the older folk names for Hawthorne. In his book, The Complete Herbal, published in 1653, English botanist and astrologer Nicholas Culpepper notes that the Hawthorne was also known as the Hagthorn. He also makes the point that the Hawthorn tree is so well known in the land of England that it needs no description. And although the book tends to focus more on the medicinal than magical purposes of herbs, he does mention superstitions still in existence about the Hawthorn tree, such as the superstitions related to the unseasonal flowering of the tree, for instance, in Glastonbury, the tree was sometimes known to flower on Christmas Day. Culpepper advises that the berries of the hawthorn tree can be beaten and ground into a powder and drank with water and that this was good for treating inward pains, particularly caused by stones in the body. Meadow sweet, or Queen of the Meadows as it's also known, grows in abundance by the beck in Downham. And Culpepper described the plant in the following way. The stalks of these are reddish, rising to about three feet high, sometimes four or five. Having at the joints large winged leaves, at the tops of the stalks stand many tufts of small white flowers thrust thick together which smell much sweeter than the leaves. As an astrologer, Culpepper claimed as association with the planet Venus and claimed that the plant could be used to treat bleeding, vomiting and women's courses. Meadowsweet is traditionally thought to have a number of magical purposes as well. In his book, Encyclopedia of Magical Herbs, for example, Scott Cunningham says that fresh meadowsweet was often placed on the altar for love spells and was used in various love mixtures. It was also strewn about the house to keep peace. Meadowsweet, when gathered at midsummer, he says, could also give you information regarding thieves. If you'd been robbed, place meadowsweet in water, and if it sinks, the thief is a man and if it floats, it's a woman. The next day I set out along the country lanes above Barley to forage in the local hedgerows. I only took a tiny bit, just enough of what I needed. As well as foxglove and thistle, ragwort grows in abundance here at this time of the year. Culpepper noted that in the early 17th century, it was thought that ragwort could heal the body of wounds and sores and also help with the pain of ulcers. 
And Scott Cunningham notes that witches were said to ride upon ragwort stalks at midnight. We might never know how the Pendle witches used these herbs, but these sources do give an insight and some inspiration into at least imagining how they might have used them in their practices, as well as the beliefs and associations that they might have had with these plants. One thing's for sure, if the information board in New Church in Pendle is anything to go by, it would seem that at least some residents still believe in the magical power of plants. On the last evening of my stay in Pendle, I decorated the hearth for Lammas and sitting by the fire, I had an idea for how to use the herbs I'd foraged for once I was back home. 